Support for the Dice Tower comes from listeners like you, and from The Op, also known as USAopoly, and from GameNerds.com. Thanks for your support. Hey, future Eric here jumping in very, very early in the show to, uh, to mention a quick audio issue. Uh, we didn't notice it until the first segment of the show was over, but Tom's mic levels were a little higher than, than we needed them to be. Uh, and we caught it after that first segment and, and dialed things back. But uh, really, we just didn't notice until Tom started getting you know, heated in, in, in the way he does, uh, you know, talking rather vociferously. But he, it was fine before he started, but then he got excited. And anyway, we fixed it soon, um, just so you know. Here's the show. The Dice Tower, episode 712. Mean and nasty games. Wow, that's scary. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Jeff gives us some advice on fudging the numbers. We answer questions from the mailbag, and we present a tale of amazement. Then we get grumpy as we discuss our top 10 mean and nasty games. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the Grinch to my Max, Tom Vassell. I don't get the Max. Max is the name of the dog. Oh, I'm thinking Mad Max. I'm like, I don't... No, <laughs> what? <laughs> well, <laughs> what did I jump to Mad Max, because Mad Max and the Grinch? Because, well, they don't always combine. I, you know, maybe I thought you picked two mean people. Mad Max is, is kind of Is this mean. like a new buddy comedy? You, you know, the Grinch and Mad Max fighting crime? Witness me! Bah, bah humbug. Oh, that's Scrooge. <laughs> now I'm getting confused. <laughs> Well, I'm confused, too. We can both be confused. Folks, welcome to the Dice Tower. I'm Tom Vassell. Hi there. I'm Eric Summerer. So it's a weird time of year because normally <laughs> this is so busy right now. Now, don't get me wrong. It's still busy. Sure. But traditionally, when you have kids, May is a phenomenal pain in the butt <laughs> because there's so much end of year stuff. Oh, that's true. Yeah, like so, end of year concerts and oh my recitals word. and yeah. I only need to hear your kindergartners sing four songs. That's it, four, <laughs> and then I'm checking out. But you know, so last year was a sad time of this because things were getting canceled that people weren't expecting to get canceled, right? Yeah. Oh, you know, and my daughter was one of those for high school graduation. Mm. I told her I said we could do it now. She 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 seemed to think a year is too late. <laughs> um, but so now things are starting to get back in a swing, but not enough to make it tremendously busy. And for that, I'm not upset. Sure. That, that makes sense. I've got some virtual choir concerts on the horizon. Uh, I'm going to a, a ninja regional competition. That's, that's something. But yeah, yeah. Not, it's not too much. I don't. So where do you stand on virtual meetings? See, what? I am. Of two minds on them. On one hand, there's a few meetings that I've been doing virtually that are going to stay virtual the rest of my life if I can help it because they get done <laughs> in a fraction of the time. But okay. there's also virtual, some virtual meetings. I'm like, I am, as soon as I can do this meeting in person, I will because I'm sick of the virtual part of it. Well, I mean, when you spend so much time in front of the computer anyway, one more virtual meeting is is the last thing you want to do. So I, I totally get wanting to get in person. But it, what it has done, you know, since we moved, we're still attending, quote unquote, our church and and being involved with stuff because we can do it all online, which is has been nice and sort of a smoother transition after our move. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter where you move. Well, well folks, if you have not been paying attention to Dice Tower Studios, main studios, we have moved. We're done moving. Uh, we're almost there. You can see things in the uh, the videos that we're doing on our channel. We appreciate your patience as we continue to make adjustments, even today, trying to figure out some more audio stuff. Audio is such a pain. Uh, For video, yeah. video is not so bad. You're just like, better lighting. It's always better lighting. <laughs> it's always you know? better lighting. Better oh, lighting. Yeah. Uh, audio, but, you've got to like isolate things and worry about hums and... 
right? Where's the problem coming from? Is it the mic? Is it this? Is it that? Yeah. Is it this? Is it that? Yeah. Ah, but so far we're getting there. And man, oh man, folks, the games are coming. Hmm. Now, games are delayed. Um, I went through my Kickstarter list today of the games that I back for the Dice Tower Library. Uh, and I'm like, I don't know, 200 games out or something. But I was going through it, checking to see that if I missed an update. Because I get so many updates, I just don't read them. Sure. You know, you get that many updates, I'm just like, no, 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 no. So I went back, like, just to make sure, did I miss a, you need to fill out this survey or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, almost every Kickstarter is months and months late. (laughs) Because there is a backlog, right? Yeah. the, The coronavirus at first didn't seem to affect things that much right but as time has gone by it's it's kind of like when you start turn and look at the crash on the other side of the road and you slow down a little bit then the cars behind you slow down a little bit yep so the whole industry is a little behind and also there's a shipping container shortage yeah. in china so games are still being designed in fact i thought it was really funny i saw a comment on one of my videos where someone said I think we're going to see a lot less games in 2021 and 2022 because the coronavirus stopped people from designing more games. And I'm like, uh, yeah, maybe testing them as yeah, efficient. You don't need to be around people to design games. Yeah. Um, but there are games coming out, even though they're late, there's coming out now. There's so sure. many games. It yeah. is a virtual tsunami. And most of them seem to be coming from Kickstarter. Yeah. There's a lot of Kickstarter stuff. But before we jump into games, folks, a couple notes here. Don't forget we have a little brother podcast, Dice Tower Now. Um, (laughs) Little brother. That's kind of what it is. But hey, it's up every week. It talks about the news. You want to hear just the news, just things that are going on, and Dice Tower Dish with Corey. Check it out. Um, Also, I should mention this. I hope it's not too late, but there are a few tickets left. For both of our retreats, the one in Mm. Miami in September and the one in Orlando in November, it is just five straight days of gaming with our amazing library, which gets better. Marvel United is now half painted, which is looking good. And Star Wars Queen's Gambit is fully painted. And I just... Wow. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. It's get better every day, folks. But anywho... If you want to come to those, if you want to go to the the one in Miami in September, email Kenny at Dicetower.com. And if you want to go to the one in November in Orlando, email Sharon at Dicetower.com. Hmm. But be warned, tickets are almost out for both. Okay. Uh, also, if you want to find out things like that before other people do, I would highly suggest subscribing to Dice Tower Digest. It's a bi-weekly email that we send out, and don't worry, we're not spamming it. I refuse to give email addresses to other people because I hate when that happens to me. Mm. But just a little short email that goes out every two weeks telling you about a little bit about Dice Tower, a little bit about things coming up. And if you want to get the puzzles, the Dice Tower puzzle and other cool things, and folks, that puzzle's amazing. Um <laughs> We're about to shut down the pledge manager soon, so just go to DicetowerKickstarter.com. All right. But we say all that because we have games to talk about. So we'll start with... Wait, let me look here. Hang on a second. Yes. Today is a day when we talk a brief amount, a bit about theme, except that's not true at all. There's no theme here, folks, in these games. (laughs) <laughs> theme be gone well actually one of eric's games has stronger theme than i thought actually but the other okay. five games have no theme uh, uh, all right well interesting um so i guess i'll start with uh probably one of the games that tom is talking about it's called mandala stone what it's be probably <laughs> what's yeah, the th- definitely. On, it's, it's a straight um, abstract game <laughs> mandala stones is an abstract game uh from philip glowash 
is his name. Uh, and Board and Dice is the publisher here. It is, um, it's based on the artistic concept of mandala, uh, using patterns, swirling patterns uh, that, that create these nice little uh, arrangements. Uh, but, but the basis of the game is based around these stones, uh, nice stones tiles, um, you know, like bake light or plastic tiles that are embossed on both ends with one of two patterns. There's sort of a, a circular pattern and a flowery starburst pattern. And these things are distributed around a board at the beginning of the game in stacks of four. In, they're in four different colors. They have two different symbols on them. And you also have little artist, like pillar people, uh, that also have one of the two symbols on them. And in order to acquire these stones, you will place one of these artists in an intersection uh, surrounding groups of stones, and then you get to acquire the stones. Anything that is not next to another artist and matches the pattern that's on the artist, you get to take. And that could be anywhere from one to even four stones if you happen to do it right. And you have to take them in in a particular order. You have to go clockwise around the artist and, and grab them in a stack. And then that stack is going to go on your player board, and each slot on your player board is going to score differently. Because instead of grabbing stones, you can score your stones. Uh, you simply take a, you look at the top of your stacks of stones, and you, you pick a color. And so maybe I pick red, and I take all the stacks that have a red stone on top, and I get to score all of those in their special rules. And some want to have large stacks, and some give you more points if you have very small stacks, and some give you lots of colors for points, and some are good if you have different levels of, of stacks on your player board. And so you'll score points for all of these, and then you'll take the top stone from all the stacks that you scored, and you put them on a master board in the center of the table uh, that may earn you extra bonus points and is also the tracker for the end of the game. So you sort of make this spiral as you're placing more and more stones on, on this board. And that's how you score points. You acquire stones from the, the first board onto your board, and then you score stones and stacks to put stones onto the center board and score points. Um, so it has sort of that sense of, I want to keep getting stones, but at some point I want to stop because I just want to score things. Um, and any stones that don't get scored aren't going to be really worth anything if I, if I don't score them before the end of the game. Um, right. I, I like getting a handle on this, this engine. Um, it's, it's a little tricky. It's, it's unfamiliar, which it is nice to do something that's somewhat unique um, in acquiring these, seeing how you can grab stones efficiently um, and how to stack them. The other neat thing is that so uh, a particular stack, uh, a scoring slot, might give you lots of points if it's four high. But then you only remove the top stone when you score it. And so now it probably has a different color, it's a different height, and you then need to score it again and again and again in order to depl diminish, uh, deplenish, yeah, get rid of the stones in that stack before you can fill it back up again and get maximum points. Um, and, and seeing how that works is not immediately intuitive, and I kind of like how that discovery happens. It plays quickly. Uh, the game's over in about 45 minutes to an hour. And uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I really like how the stones are embossed on both sides. That makes it easier to manipulate when you pull them out of the bag. You don't have to flip them all over. It's very simple. You just stack them and place them. Um, it was a little weird to get our head around how to grab the stones. You're supposed to, uh, you know, grab them one at a time and sort of stack them on your board. But we really wanted to treat them like poker chips and go grab, grab, grab. Um, and figuring out what order we were supposed to do that in and not mess it up was a little tricky. You're supposed to go clockwise, but if you're grabbing them the way we wanted to, we had to go counterclockwise, and that just messed with our heads. Minor problem, more of a learning how the system works issue. Mandala Stones was a lot of fun. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it has that Azul vibe, um, but, uh, but a fun one. I like it. Yeah, this one for me is okay. Um, it definitely gives an Azul vibe in how it looks, but I don't believe it's as clever or as simple as Azul, both mm. of which I think is going to affect it in the long run. Also, the name doesn't help because you think it's Mandala. And Mancala. It's Mancala, right. I'm sorry. You think it's right. Mancala, and it's not. Um, yeah, there's no connection there at all. There's also some weird things like you very rarely want to set somebody else up in this game. You, I mean, you don't want to set someone up, so it right. doesn't happen. I mean, or you can just say it's never going to happen, therefore it doesn't, which makes the four stack not as useful. Hmm. Um, 
You can I, do it maybe early on in the game if you manage to get things just right, but it's harder later on, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's my final, eh, is that this game gets less interesting as it goes on. I prefer my games to get more interesting. Now, sometimes there's a really good game at, like, everyone likes Five Tribes, and in my opinion, Five Tribes gets slightly less interesting because, you again, there's a depletion of the game pieces. Right. So maybe if you're listening, that's a feature to you instead of a bug, in which case don't listen to me at all. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, as as you get closer to that tipping point where you want to focus on scoring more than acquisition, certainly the, the, the pieces that are on the board are there's fewer of them on there at that point. And so you don't really want to pay attention to that part of the game anymore. You want to score what you've got. Mm. All right. I want to talk about which stone. That's, which stone? Uh, that stone. This stone? Right. So, yes, so just, again, this is a one-word game, and it's W-I-T-C-H-S-T-O-N-E. And, in fact, I was saying, I was listening to a podcast where they were talking about overused themes, and they said zombies and trading in the Mediterranean. And I think, clearly, the use of magic so that you can make your game mechanisms to, like, wow, magic, is overused maybe at this point. <laughs> there sure is a lot of games about making potions somehow. But that's what Witchstone is. Fine. It's a collection of mechanisms. It's designed by Martino uh, <laughs> Chiara and Reiner Knizia. Okay. Now, Reiner Knizia, of course, one of the most famous designers in board gaming, but he hasn't designed many big games in the past decade. He's mostly done little card games, with a few exceptions. This is one of those exceptions. It's a 60 to 90 minute game. And it's a game I think Eric would like. Hmm. In this game, you're trying to score the most points, and you do so by you have a cauldron in front of you, and you have 15 tiles. And on your turn, you will pick one of five tiles. The rest are in a face-down pile that you'll replenish. So you have five tiles to pick from. Each tile has two sides to it that represent two of the six different actions you can take in this game. You place this tile in your cauldron, and depending on where you place it, you get to take both of those actions on each side. But if you place the actions next to other actions of the same kind, you can take that action more times. So, like, there's a magic wand action. If I play a tile with a magic wand, but I set it next to a group of three magic wands, adding a fourth one to that group, I now can take the magic wand action four times. Okay. I think Mermies. Mermies, I'm sorry. Yeah. Things like that. I, I tend to really like that mechanism a lot, you know, where you're building this little thing in front of you. So each person has their own cauldron. They're doing that. Th these actions all affect kind of the board. There's a spot in the middle where you're building connections, a little bit like Ticket to Ride, um, and you get points for making these connections, and you have these little witches that you'll put on these connections and move around. You're filling potions. You're collecting cards that give you scoring opportunities. You have a magic wand action, which lets you move farther down the magic wand track. In your cauldron, there's these little gems that get in the way, but some of your actions can move the gems out. And almost all these actions, when you do them, there's sometimes ways to get bonus actions so that you can then do a different action. Like I might move a witch on the connections, and then I get a bonus token, which lets me do the magic wand, and then I move the magic wand up, which by moving to a certain space, I get to do the potion action twice. That sort of thing to me is fun. Okay. Where your actions all come back and forth. But the whole thing is a point salad. Honestly, if you had given me this game and said who designed it, I would have told you Stefan Feld. Huh, okay. It really feels like one of his games. Hmm. There's no theme that I can even imagine. I don't know why I'm moving a piece down a long magic wand. Or why you're spinning around this magical circle at the top. Who knows? Who cares? <laughs> it's a solid game, and there's something about... When you put down the tile, you're like, oh, I get to do this action five times. That's fun. You know, but you only get to do the other action once because, you know, it's not touching anything else because of where you have to put the tile down. But if I put it over here, I could do each action twice, but uh, I want to do the one action five times. Solid game, pretty components. Yes, it might be forgettable, you know, yeah. in three or four years. I don't know. But I had a fun time playing it. It's, 
I'm definitely coming around on the point salad type thing of in games, and which stone is a good example of that. Okay. Next up for me is a game called Barrage. This uh, came out in 2019. It's a light it's party from- game. A light party game. No, very much not. Uh, It's from Cranio Creations and designers Tommaso Batista and Simone Luciani. Uh, It is a game about hydroelectric dominance. Uh, You've got a board that's that's sort of... (laughs) Okay, fine. I never, I didn't know that was the tagline, but all right. Yeah, yes. Uh, it, it's set in like uh, an alternate 1930s, sort of a steampunky, very strange stylistic version of the 1930s. Um, the board is um, four four columns of, of rivers. Uh, so water starts at the top and it's going to flow down. And there are lots of places for you to place dams. Uh, not only dams, but also hydroelectric plants. Uh, and power stations. And it's not just a straight line either. There's sort of like crisscrossing power lines where a hydroelectric facility can shoot across the board to a power plant elsewhere. And of course, there's costs to build all of these things. The mechanism for building these things is a worker placement. You have a whole bunch of workers, a lot of them, which is is sort of nice. You start each round with a bunch of these workers. And um, you're going to place to earn money and uh, get resources and and then eventually build these structures. And when you build stuff, you have, uh, let's see, what is it, cement mixers and you've got one other um, you know resource that you're using to build stuff. But you don't lose it. It goes in this rondelle, this wheel. Uh, as you say, I, I build a, a dam. Uh, and so I get to place a dam, uh, and I can also build levels on on that dam, and I'll place the resources I need to build that dam in that wedge of the wheel, and the wheel then rotates. And there are other actions that can rotate it more than normal. I can pay to rotate it more, but every time I build something, it's going to move one click on the thing. And once it comes all the way around, not only do I get that action token back so I could build another piece of the dam, but I also get those resources back. So I can now build something else with those cement mixers and and machinery. I I can also upgrade those action tiles so I can build pieces of hydroelectric plants more efficiently and get bonus actions while I do so and and gives me extra powers like turning that wheel more often and um, bonuses for building certain actions. But the primary way that I'm going to earn points is by activating these power plants. But I need water to do so. That water flows down from the mountains, and it has to be collected at one of your dams, and then you use it with one of your power plants to earn points. And making sure that happens is kind of tricky because there aren't many water droplets on the board. Uh, You can pay to put more out there, but they they trickle. They trickle down, literally. Literally. Uh, in this game, and there are tons of ways for somebody to build a dam upstream of you. The jerks! Um, so you you might think you have a, a wonderful thing, and you have expended plenty of resources to build this machine that is going to earn you points, and you've got this whole thing triggered and figured out, and then somebody just goes, you know what, I'm going to build here. And now, the water has to go over their dam first, and they will usually shunt it off somewhere else that is no longer in the line uh, uh, where you are. Um, And you can build the dams higher so they can hold more water and uh, then try and overflow other people's dams. It becomes very interactive very quickly. Um, And for being such a thinky game, it can really mess with you if if you have invested a lot in getting uh, something to work and somebody just basically steals it from you. But you can do the same thing to somebody else, and you kind of need to, to to keep all those plates spinning. Um, it is very thinky, quite heavy. It's a lengthy game, um, but but a rewarding one. I really enjoyed Barrage, and uh, and and need to play it again soon before I forget all the mistakes I made the first time. So you thumbs won't. up on Barrage. I I won't, but I I'd like to. All right, so that's the game I think that is the is the most thematic. It feels it actually, thematic. Right, I, I I was thinking no, it's that's actually not just another um, Euro game. In fact, one of the things I think is really thematic about the game, the wheel is actually thematic because you put a bunch of workers to go. They're, they're, they they feel like resources, but they're actually workers. Yeah, yeah to yeah. go do something, and they're on the wheel. They move around, so it's it's like oh, they're gone for five hours working on right. this project. It, it I takes like them that. that long to finish it. Yeah. All right, the next game I'm going to talk about is a game that uses rubber bands, 
which made me instantly want to get it. It's called okay. Rule the Realm. It was originally called Cauchuk, C A U C H U K, but and it was from lifestyle board games, but I never saw it when it was like that. But someone pointed it out to me and I found it on Amazon. Rule the Realm has like a pegboard. And it comes with these little my wife says they're like cheap hair ties for girls. Okay. Uh of different colors. And you got a whole lot of them. So I know some people are already talking about the, them breaking. I think half of them would have to break before I would have to go get more. Hmm. I haven't had any break, by the way. So anyhow, on your turn, it's very similar to Ticket to Ride. There's cards that match different colors, and you have two actions. You can draw cards, or you can play cards and then put rubber bands connecting pegs in the board. So if I play a blue, red, and orange card, I can make a little triangle and connect these pegs. You can make triangles, diamonds, or straight lines. And when you make these triangles, diamonds, and straight lines, you are surrounding areas that give you two things, points, which is how you win, and blue crystals. If you collect enough blue crystals, you can spend three on your turn to get a third action. And considering many games have only eight turns, a third action is a big deal. Here's the other thing that's cool. Every every time you play, you can play a different scenario. There's eight scenarios included with the game. So there's these boards that fit on top of the pegs. So one's an archaeological dig. One's a volcano blowing up. One is, I, I don't know what they all are, but they all have slightly different rules and different things that you can do on them. It's fairly simple. It's welcoming game level, sort of maybe... A, Along the lines of Ticket to Ride, maybe even a little bit more complex than Ticket to Ride. I really like it. My wife also really enjoyed it. Uh, it definitely has a little bit of interaction. At first, you, you're you building your own area, then pretty soon you're fighting. And in fact, if you use someone else's peg, you have to pay them a card. So okay. if I wrap my rubber band around a, a band you already have your rubber band wrapped around, you get the card instead of me discarding it. And it just, it's just—it's—it's a gimmick. It's It's a gimmick. There's no question it's a gimmick, but it's a gimmick that works. So mm. I like it. That's Rule the Realm. Okay. Uh, so last for me is a game that I have wanted to play for some time, but just have never had a chance to uh, to sit down in front of. It's from 2018 called Castell. Uh, this is by Aaron Vanderbeek and Renegade Game Studios. Castell, uh, I'm going to have to argue with you a little bit. You know um, what? Yeah, Sorry, I, I, thought, I thought the game was Castelli. So... Uh, ah. Or okay. Cast- yeah, Castelli is a abstract game. Let me go back. Go ahead. This 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 one is thematic. Yes. Yes. Uh, it, Castel is it's a like a folk tradition uh, in the lower region of Spain in Catalonia, uh, where people make these human towers, um, and you are a team of Castellers. Uh, moving around Catalonia and and increasing your team and continuing to make better and better towers of people. Uh, the, the people are represented by these tiles that have numerical values and also height. They have like a, a size. The, the 9 and the 10 are the same height and the 7 and the 8 are the same height. And they, they sort of go down the line. Um, and... You Each turn, you get uh, a few actions. You can move around the board. You can uh, recruit more castellers. Um, they'll be you know, spread around in, in these different locations. Um, you can train your castellers. At the beginning of the game, you can only build a pyramid that starts three wide and then goes to two and then goes to one. And you have to go down in number as you build these. Um, but you can increase your ability to make your bases wider, to um, build the same size from one level to the next, to build the same or even a greater number as you go up the tower, and basically all of these abilities to make a better, cooler, stronger tower. There are even um, patterns that you're trying to emulate, uh, sort of put on an exhibition performance and and uh, use your special action to, to show off and make this particular tower structure to earn extra points. There's also tournaments that occur periodically as the game goes on. It goes over 10 rounds, and so maybe in round three, there will be a, a tournament in a particular location. And if you end your turn in that location, you can compete and, uh, and earn points for the structure that you have built. Um, so it's all about gaining these these uh, tiles, sort of creating sets. Say if I have a bunch of sevens, maybe I want more sevens to be able to use them in better structures. Um, those performances, the tournaments, require certain values in order to participate. So I have to make sure I've got 
you know, a six in my tower if I want to compete in this this tournament. Um, but also the way that they have to be built, I'm, you're constantly rearranging your tiles to create better and better structures, making them taller, making them wider, making them um, more stable. And uh, it's it's really kind of cool, puzzly, as you work around and try and, um, you know, figure out your turn. So downtime seems good because when it's not your turn, you're still fiddling with your tower and figuring out what you're going to do next. And by the time you're like, okay, I think that's what I want to do. Oh, is it my turn again? Here we go. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I'm glad I finally got a chance to get this to the table. Thank you to Brant from the the Portal um, Gaming Podcast for saying, hey, let me teach you this game. And so uh, we managed to do that uh, just a few days ago. And so I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's one um, that, that should be in, in any gaming libraries uh, that, that you may have access to. Um, just saying. This is one of those games that I liked a lot and... I was always culling my collection, so it just is out of my collection. And I sit yeah. there thinking, ah, I, sh- I should have this in a Dice Tower library. I also don't know if anyone would play it. Again, the name is, I, I, for, you know, I even forgot it based on the name. As soon as I saw the picture of it, I was like, oh, that's right. I know this game. There's a lot of games actually that have the word Castell in them. Hmm. There's, well, for the is it the region? Is this no? It's because it's Catalonia. Well, there's Castel, there's Castellion, there's Castellan. Yeah, uh, which is another yeah. abstract game. Castelli, Castellers. Word. Right, yeah. and that's you know, I get it. You know, and this is actually I think one of three games I've played on this topic, but it's the best one. Hmm. Yeah, it reminded me of there was a, a circus game from um, uh, was it called Drum Roll? No, that might not be it. Uh, uh, circus roll. train, circus train is what I'm thinking of. Uh, it was um, it was a victory, very early victory point games where you also were building a team and traveling around the U.S. In this case, and and sort of putting on exhibition performances. It's similar, but this I like better because it has that puzzly aspect as you build your tower and and complete those sets and and upgrade your castellers. I like this a lot better. All righty. Let's talk about Hadrian's Wall. Ah, yes. Interested to hear how you liked this one. You played this one. I think you talked yes, about indeed. it previous. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to give real quick my thoughts on this one. It's from Garfield Games, and I'm playing everything from Garfield Games because I tend to like his stuff. I don't yeah. like everything, but I really the stuff I like, I like. And uh, this one's by Bobby Hill, a designer I like. This is I was this was pitched to me as one of the more complicated role and rights in existence. Yep. Which is true. Yep. Um, in this game, just quick overview, you have these two giant sheets of paper and, well, they're not that big, but it comes, It's there's a lot. There's a ton of information on these sheets. Lots and lots yeah. of squares. And you get a bunch of little meeple people, little dudes, at the beginning of each round. You spend them to color in squares, which lets you, as you, as you fill in different rows, you get more of them, which you can then use to fill in other spots. And it's this... There's just a gazillion different things, and they all work off of each other, but you're trying to fill in four rows specifically that give you points. That is a very, very, very short description. You <laughs> Go watch yes. the video if you want to see more about it. Yes. I just want to give my impressions on it. So first of all, this is possibly the most solitaire game of all solitariness. <laughs> yeah. It says it plays one to six players. You are literally playing by yourself. You don't care what anyone else is doing at all. I don't know. I mean, you, you nothing they do affects you with the tiny exception. Yeah. There's a card you play and someone can use a resource off that card or I mean trade for a, a trade good off that card yeah, or use a, a Tetris thing. shape on that card. But yeah. honestly, the solo version of the game has you flip over a couple of those that you can use at, when you're playing. So it's the same thing, right? Right. I have never, and I can't imagine anybody ever looking at their card and go, I don't want to give them that good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it, and if you are that, then I don't want to play against you because you're wow. playing at a different level. Yeah. Right. So just realize that going in, when I was done with Adrian's wall, the first game, I was like, that's my score. I don't care what everyone else got because next time I play, I'm going to beat my score. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So fine. It, I really like it. The other thing about the game, though, is I don't know what I'm doing, but I still like it. So, for <laughs> example, you can 
there might be there's a wall you build and you spend blue people to build the wall and as you move four down the wall you'll get a stone and I could use the stone over here and if I use the stone there I get a yellow worker which I could use over there and so on and so forth the way I play is I'll say I want to do this thing here what do I need yeah okay I need three yellow people okay then the yellow people come from this track for that track I need the black soldiers okay I have two of them I need a third one and I work a little bit backwards but I also go I got a I got a black soldier. Where can I spend it? There. Oh look, they gave me a yellow guy. Okay, where can I spend him? Oh look, I can spend it over there. Cool. And and you just keep doing that. You have these little moments of woo, yeah, woo, neat. And then yeah. suddenly you run out of stuff. You're like, okay, I'm done. And you look up and everyone else is, you know, the the one there's that one person at the table and they're like, oh, I have it. I I still have like 16 people. And you're like, well, shut up. I don't want to play against you. <laughs> um, but it's fun. I don't have the brain power or the analysis paralysis to put too much forethought into it. Hmm. Like, in fact, when I played it the first time, I handed out pens. And I said a square crossed out is a square crossed out. (laughs) Okay. One of the players decided to just put the people on the squares. And then they would take them off and redo everything. (laughs) <laughs> Eric, you know this person well. Um, and that person like quadrupled my score. But yeah, either way, I really think to me it's just an experience, an experiential game. I'm sure you can get really good at this game. I'm sure I never will. But I still had fun because the game gives me so many little moments of like, ooh, I made a combo. I didn't yeah. even mean to, but it was fun. Yeah, it's very rewarding that way. Right. But like if Eric said, I'm challenging you to Hadrian's wall, I would just knock on the table and say, you win. But I'll still play it. Okay. But, but I'm not trying to necessarily beat Eric. I mean, I get, I am, but you know what I mean? It's like uh, if, if, if you won, I'd be like, okay, cool. I don't know what you did differently than me, you know, because you, <laughs> you went down this way different path. Yeah. And you play simultaneously so you don't even watch everyone else go. Yes. But I still like it. So it's weird. It's a kind of a weird mix. Yeah. Um, so that's Hadrian's Wall. Yeah. I think with the complexity, you you if you were worried too much about what other people were doing, it would get overwhelming. You, you're so focused oh, my on word. your own yes. thing. It, it, it's good that you don't have that much interaction because Can there's so much Can you imagine if it so was turns? It. Oh, if my it was goodness. Turns, yeah, that would be I'd be like, all right, your turn. My turn. Yeah, no. Ah. No, no, no. All all simultaneous. Do your stuff. Hadrian's Wall. So, Tom, have you ever, um, you know, fudged things if things aren't going well for you and you, you just sort of make it a little easier the next time? Never. Let's, let's uh, hear what Jeff has to say. It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein, where we find out how games really work. Back in the dark ages of the late 80s and early 90s, there was a bulletin board service called Genie, the General Electric Network for Information Exchange is what it stood for. And we actually had to dial into it with modems. Now, there was a very active board game community on Genie, specifically around the Game Advance Squad Leader. There were lots of online games played, and back then it was done by laboriously writing down where your pieces were moving, hex by hex. Now to speed things along a bit, for most games, the dice were just rolled on the honor system. You just rolled the dice as you made them and recorded your moves and put the rolls into the message. And as far as I know, there was not any cheating. I mean, it was pretty low stakes, but still. In fact, For me, at least, the biggest concern I had was that when I had a string of good die rolls, that my opponent would think they were too good and would think I was fudging things a bit. That was the only time I was tempted to change the rolls or re-roll, when the rolls were too good and streaky for me, not when they were too bad. Now, I'm not telling myself telling this story to make myself look good. I am sure that there were many others that felt the same way. I am telling this story to emphasize how incredibly bad we are at knowing what is and is not random. We dramatically underestimate how streaky a random sequence will be by a lot. 
This is exhibited by how bad we are at creating what we think are random sequences. Let's say you give an expert two different sequences of ones and zeros, one created by a true random number generator and one created by a person asked to make a sequence that looks random, you will always be able to tell them apart. It is a blind spot for humans. Now, years ago, I did a game tech where I talked about this, particularly around Catan and how people always complain that number X or Y, in our house, it always tended to be nines, came up way more or less frequently than they should have. And in one sense, they are correct. Given the number of roles in a typical game of Catan, the distribution will only rarely match the expectation value. Now, because players' expectations about randomness and the reality of it are so often at odds, no pun intended, game designers have had to deal with this. Now, famous video game designer Sid Meier had an issue with this in battles in the original version of the game Civilization. The way combat was done in the game, the odds were very clearly presented to the players. They're just sort of a ratio of the strength. But when the players were given presented with a 3 to 1 or a 4 to 1 odds battle, they just flat out expected to win. With 2 to 1 odds, uh, players accepted losing some of the time, but they also expected to win at 20 to 10, which is the same thing as 2 to 1, just doubled. When numbers get large, perceived advantage grows, and just in general, we are really bad at judging this kind of stuff. He observed that if players lost too many two to one battles in a row, they started to get frustrated, even though that's the math. You're just gonna lose two or three of those in a row just naturally. He ended up dealing with this by fudging the dice rolls behind the scenes. If you lose a battle, you actually got a secret hidden bonus in the next one, a bonus that kept increasing until the player won a battle, then it reset back to zero. In World of Warcraft, when it first came out, Blizzard had a similar issue with quest items. Now, when you're on a quest, you might need to collect certain items in battle and they drop randomly as a result. However, players hated it if they went too long without getting the drop they needed. We're getting really, really frustrated. So Blizzard implemented a similar system as Sid Meier. They had a hidden bonus counter that increased if the needed loot did not drop. When it finally did, that bonus reset back to zero. And similarly, many first-person shooters fudge your attacks and make them hit more often than they should. Now, while this wasn't a mathematically consistent system used in Civilization or World of Warcraft, it made the players feel better about it and think the randomness was more in line with their expectations. Some of the things have been done with loot packs and stuff like that. Uh, Hearthstone, for example, will guarantee if you don't get a legendary that your chances of getting the legendary as you go will increase, increase, increase as you get more packs. Now, board games have used similar mechanisms over the years. There are some games where if you miss a die roll or a skill check, you gain a bonus token that gives you a plus one or plus two the next try. You can keep gaining these until success is assured. Now, these systems are way more visible in a board game. In a video game, most players don't even realize that this type of fudging is going on. But with board games, it's right there in your face. And yet, Players are really forgiving this. I've never seen a player be upset by their opponent being helped for the future if they miss a die roll. It's treated, and honestly rightfully so in my opinion, as a slight catch-up me mechanism and has a light touch to it. However, I could see areas where thematically it doesn't make sense or could be gamed. I've never seen it really in a war game, for example. I could see a tactic where you try to make a bunch of unimportant attacks, hoping to fail your die rolls to earn a bonus for the big attack you really need to win. And I guess in Civilization, that was something that players could do. But again, in the computer games, it's hidden and you don't really know what the bonuses are. So balancing randomness and the fun that that brings to a game with perceived unfairness when that randomness backfires and you get lots of streaks can be a delicate balance for the game designer. Consider giving your players the tools to manage their own luck and turn it into another area to show skill and mastery. This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. Okay, well, um, the the randomness thing here is fascinating to me. Like, like where he so like where you uh, where where we don't as humans understand how random something is or not. Well, not to, right. There's that, but the the first part where he's talking about a human can't generate a random string of numbers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yep. So this matters. Uh, as a teacher, I always thought about this when it came to if I did a multiple choice test. Right. I wanted the A, B, C, D answers or whatever they were to be random. Sure. 
So you're like, okay, the first one's A, the next one's D, then I'll do B. Guess what? <laughs> I'll do B again. Yeah. But you also tend to make it spread A, B, C, D throughout the test. So I figured out after a while, you know what? I'm just going to roll a die. Yeah. Because a physical die, while well, it's not perfectly random, I know, blah, blah, blah. It's still a better for version of randomness than what I can come up with. And, folks, I think I mentioned this on the show before, but this also will help you become a champion at rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> okay. I don't know if it was Jeff who taught me this or where I read this, but if you're going to play someone at rock, paper, scissors, roll a die and randomly make a sequence of rock, paper, scissors for as long as you need it to be. Yep. Then you go into that rock, paper, scissors match and you follow that sequence. Do not, do not deviate. Yep. And your opponent is trying to outguess you, but you're playing truly random. <laughs> and you will likely win. Okay. Or at least you have a slightly better chance because it's still very, you know, lucky. Sure. But it's, uh, I like this whole thing. I like the whole a streak of luck. This is, I don't think Jeff mentioned in a segment, but this is why a lot of people lose at gambling because there's the gambling fallacy where if you lose a 50-50 thing, let's say the roulette wheel, which is not 50-50, but pretend it is. Right. If you lose 50-50, you double your bet, go in and play again, and you keep doing that till you win. Right. Because you can't lose that many times in a row, but the fact is, yes, you can. You can, yeah. And you might, because that's how luck works. Anyway, yes. great segment. Jeff, I love this stuff. And I fudge things all the time in well, games that I'm running for other people. And and I, I like, you know, you sort of see this in some game designs where failure gets you some sort of bonus for the next round. Uh, sometimes this is totally above the board. It's not hidden behind the scenes. You you If you messed up, you get a plus one for the next time or, or a um, get out of jail free card for the next round. I think it's great. The new version of Kemet has this. It's very minor, but it gives you some tokens when you lose. Um, I remember the new version between the first and the, what, umpteenth version of Kill Dr. Lucky. Huh. Added this in. You played Kill Dr. Lucky, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what version it was, but yes. Well, in one of the newer versions, they added spite tokens, where every time you failed or something, you know, stuff happened, you got these spike tokens and you could spend those to add to your attacks as time went by. Oh, okay. So the more you failed, the better chance you had to finally succeed. Which gives you incentive to try more often. Yes. Right. So great. Love this. All right. Let's, uh, we, we've done been doing some tales of horror for a little while. Uh, after this word from our sponsor, we're going to have a tale of amazement. Support for the Dice Tower comes from The Op, which has been creating games and memories for over 25 years. From party games like Telestrations and Blank Slate, to game night favorites with Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle and the Rising series, to new games like Hues and Cues and Tapple, The Op is a one-stop shop for game night. With games for friends and family, you can create your next game night memory with The Op. Fuel your fandom with an array of licensed puzzles, dice, and accessories. The Op has a great array of games for any occasion. Looking for your next game for game night? Check out the op.games website with games for everyone, from the pop culture geek to mom and dad and your friends, too. And now... It's time to marvel at another tale of amazement. In the summer of 2018, my family moved from Illinois to Wisconsin. I left behind a great gaming group. I knew a few people where we moved to, but none that were into the hobby. A year and a half later, I still had not found a new group. However, our church was promoting the launch of the 2020 Spring Small Groups. We were all encouraged to host a group based on our own interests. Yes, this was my chance to start a new gaming group. Well, the day finally came. It was the night of my first game night. I had drinks and snacks ready, as well as a few game options pre-selected. I had one guy, Ryan, show up. Ryan, also in his mid-30s, had a little experience with hobby games and easily picked up on Naya, Dead Man's Draw, and Forbidden Island. Just then, the doorbell rang. 
Augie, who was close to twice our age, had gotten lost and was trying to find my house for an hour. Augie had zero experience with these types of games. The next game on the schedule was Jamaica. I set it up, went over the rules, and we started the game. A couple rounds went by, and I noticed that Augie was choosing and playing his action card before the dice were even rolled. I gently reminded him to wait until the dice were rolled and assigned to the day and night values and then place his card face down until we had all chosen the card we were to play. Well, this reminder happened a couple more times before I finally decided to just roll with it and let him continue to play that way and just enjoy the game in his own way. Finally, the first ship reached Port Royal and the game was over. It wasn't my ship and it wasn't Ryan's ship. Somehow, Augie had blindly played his cards for the entire game and pulled so far ahead of us that he ended up winning with a score more than mine and Ryan's combined. It wasn't the first game night that I was hoping for, but Augie had a great time and, until COVID shut us down, was the only guy to make it to every game night. Huzzah! Yeah, I really like this. Um, I like... You know, it's funny, actually. So, folks, if you don't, real quick, Jamaica, every round you roll two dice, and then you pick one of the cards from your hand. You're going to decide which you, one side of the card matches one die, the other side card matches the other side. So you might hmm. pick one side for movement, one side to attack somebody, whatever it might be. I don't think you can win doing that randomly. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible, apparently. But I think that's great. It's It's so fun to see new people jump into gaming um i just had a guy come over and he walked in to the to the game library and it you know blew his mind as it does most people right and he was like oh wow what kind of games are these and i thought oh oh no you know i thought these i i just assumed this guy was like a, a hardcore gamer um and he pulled monopoly deal out of his pocket and huh. i Monopoly deal is a 1.5 for me. And I don't even know why I gave it a 0.5. But um, <laughs> so, but then he was like, wow. And they started showing him the games. And he just, he's like so excited. Everything is new. Everything's exciting. And I like that. Yeah. That's that's just a neat thing to see, right? Um, we can get really jaded. And I'm glad to see when newcomers have a great time. I also like, uh, you know, the approach of just letting him play the game he wants to play. Like if he were getting frustrated and I'm not understanding this, I'm not having fun anymore, then, yeah, maybe some more intervention is necessary. But at some point, you just go, you know, you play the game you want to play. Um, I'm not going to force you to play a particular way. You're having fun. Let's play the game that way. And it turned out to work great, and and Augie kept coming back, uh, which is which is also fantastic. All right. Question time. Questions. 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 All right. Sam emails in and he says he has an observation, but he wanted to know if we could relate to it. Where he said sometimes mm. he wants to play a specific game, doesn't care who he plays it with, just wants to play the game. The problem is getting the people to play the game, getting a certain number of people yep. to do it. And his first priority no longer becomes, I want to see so-and-so and playing a game with them seems like a fun way to foster that relationship. It becomes, I want to play X game and I just need to find anybody with who has a working brain and a desire to also spend <laughs> one to two hours playing it with me. I just need a warm body to fill the seat. It's for this reason that I'm starting to feel desensitized to the joy of spending time with people around a table and I'm solely seeking to throw the game and not the people off of my friends and family. Do you ever hmm. feel similar have you wanted to play a game so much you couldn't care less who sits at the table with you to play it, so long as they're also willing to play? And then he also said, how do you resist that state of mind desiring to play a game more than enjoying the people you're with? How do you orient your attitude in the correct way? Hmm. Uh, I mean, I, I think certainly we all can sort of fall somewhere on the gradient here, especially when you have a new game that you really just want to get to the table. Um, you know, the focus is on, let's get this game to the table. I want to play this game. Uh, and you can sometimes forget that you are getting together with other people. There's another human being on the other side of the table from you. Um, and and I think one thing that uh, that always helps me is is the small talk, you know, you know, if, find a lull when it's not either of your turns. Ask how somebody's week went or, um, you know, what have they what else have they been playing lately or asking about uh, the wife and kids that you may have heard about. Um, 
keeping it as a an interpersonal relationship and not just playing the latest greatest. Try and uh, take the blinders off a little bit and and remember that there's another person, uh, at least one, at the other side of the table. That that often works for me. Um, like we just had our first real game meeting uh, just a couple weekends ago, and there was a lot of catch up. We almost had to forget, <laughs> we, we almost had to remember to play the games uh, because we all just wanted to chat so much, um, and we were a little out of practice in keeping the blinders on. So uh, just remembering that there's somebody else over there, and and uh, some light conversation that doesn't distract too much from that game that you're so focused on is a good way to go. Yeah, I think. This is a really weird time to ask this question, right? Because same yeah. thing happened. We got together for gaming a couple of weeks ago, and we just all stood around and talked, you know, for yeah. for like an hour yeah, yeah. before we even started grabbing games. I yeah, we started an hour early just to make sure that we had enough chat time before we we get sat down to play. I'm just going to defer to other people, Sam, because if I want to get a game played, I'll find someone to do it with, right? I'll get it played, but I'd rather the the good people. I, I don't know. If I have a game I really want to get played, I don't know. I just I always know I can find somebody to do it, and it might not be now. It might be later, and then I'll just play whatever game is there. So I'm not the best person yeah. to answer this. <laughs> David says, reviewers often talk about theme in a game and say it is non-existent, even though there is a theme, such as Praga Kaput Regni, Orléans, or Red Cathedral. If a game has a setting... Doesn't it also have a little bit of a theme? I think games should also be rated on the setting, which might be different than theme. The only themeless games in my mind are purely abstract games, such as Checkers, Yinch, Pentago, Yahtzee. Can you discuss how a setting becomes part of the theme of a game? I think the setting of a game creates a theme for me. Don't be afraid to use your imagination. All right, let me crack my knuckles here. All right, here Uh, I come. All right, first of all, No, the setting doesn't mean there's a theme. For example, let's look at chess. As your king, does that feel like a knight when you move him two spaces forward and one space to the side? Does that help? I don't think so. That's purely abstract, but the setting is a battlefield with two armies. But that doesn't mean there's a theme there. So that is a themeless game. And there are many, many games. I mentioned one earlier, the, the witch game that it's... Yeah, there's some, there's a setting there, but it's it's themeless. I and I, again, if you find a theme in it, that's fine. I don't mind that, but I'm gonna call it what I think it is. Lost Cities is not about exploring through jungles. It is a themeless two player card game. It's a fun one, <laughs> but that theme isn't there. What I don't right. like is this. Don't be afraid to use your imagination a little. Because that's a that's really close to like a phrase like lighten up. Um, it it has this. <laughs> well, you're dumb and your imagination's not good enough. If you had a good imagination, you'd enjoy this. I have a really good imagination. I know this. I make up all kinds of weird stories. I tell my kids all kinds of stuff. But if a game doesn't have theme, I don't want to have to like work hard to use my imagination. Also, why I'm trying to play the game. I think it's on the game designer if they want it to be thematic. Maybe they don't want it to be thematic. But if they want the game to be thematic, it's on them to put it in the game. I, blah, 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 blah. I'm just saying. <laughs> theme. theme. I can call a game abstract. I don't care what the setting is. <laughs> There's a lot of games. Yeah. We call it pasted on theme. Um, maybe we could call it pasted on setting. But I don't know. It's it's all one of the same. Note. I mean... Well, so David's not totally wrong in that there are many of these games that we call themeless or or abstract do have some sort of setting and do have an overlay of theme on them, but it's a gradient. It's this is another continuum. And and if the game if the game's setting or theme is not supported directly by specific mechanisms that make you feel like you are living that theme, then it can feel disconnected. And when we say that a game is themeless, I think we often mean it is disconnected sufficiently from the theme that it could be something else without changing the way the game fundamentally plays. If you could swap out the theme or the setting, put this easily somewhere else with very little change, then it then it feels themeless. 
But if there are mechanisms that feel like you're doing that action, it would be much more difficult to move it to something else. And so we feel like it has that thematic connection. Um, but for some people, they're not as concerned about that. And if you say, all right, you're merchants in the Mediterranean and you're selling goods. Okay, great theme. Happy for that. That's all they need. Um, but others want more of that connection that feels unique or different and, and unique to this game um, as opposed to being able to be swapped out. All right. Another Sam has a question for us. Uh, he said when he first started watching board game reviews on YouTube, he was surprised that reviewers seemed to refer to the publisher of the game more often than the designer. After a while, I discovered that publishers do generally have a huge impact on the development of the game, so I started to understand it. Let me quick do an aside here because this question is not about this. Partially, it's because I can pronounce the name easier um, sometimes. <laughs> I, you know, I was wondering if that's what you were going to say, but yeah, okay. Uh, that's not a great excuse, but that is, and it's also, I know the publisher, right? I know it's a Days of Wonder game, so if you're like, what's this? Who designed uh, Mystery of the Abbey? I'm like, oh, who was that? Uh, that's Bruno Theduti and Bruno Catala, I think. But I know yeah. it's Days of Wonder. Um, uh, but you're right. We, we try to mention the designers and work on that. But anyway, he says, yep. living in Europe while watching American reviews has confronted me with, with the fact that most games have multiple publishers. His copy of Quacks of Quedlingburg is from Schmidt Spiel, while my copy that yep. I reviewed was North Star Games. And they look exactly the same. How does this work? Are multiple companies involved in the development process? Or is there an original publisher of games? And if so, why isn't the original publisher mentioned by reviewers too? And why is it so hard to find information about this for a specific game? What are your opinions about this? All right, well, <laughs> first of all, I got a nice solution for you, Sam, about finding the information. Board Game Geek. BoardGameGeek.com yes. has every publisher of a game listed. Well, I don't... There's probably some holes in there somewhere, but... You want to know who published a game? You just go to the easiest way, and this is what I do. In your search bar, type, um, let's say, uh, we'll do Quacks of Quedlingburg. So I would type Quacks of Quedlingburg, and then I type BGG, and it will take you right to the page. And then when you go to the page, underneath it, it says Designer, Artist, Publisher. So under Quacks of Quedlingburg, it says Schmitzspiel plus 12 more. And then you go down yeah. there, and it was, it's been published by Schmidt Spiel, 999 Games, Arclight, CMYK, and a couple I'm not going to be able to pronounce. So, one of them being North Star Games. Almost always, when the designer gets a game published, they go to, the public, they go to a publisher. I, I can't think of many times where this happens, where they're talking to more than one publisher. It, it might happen somewhere. Right. But that publisher will publish the game, other publishers will express interest or that publisher may be partnered with other publishers. Mm -hmm. Those publishers then license it from the first publisher with the author getting a percentage based on what the original contract is written. Like when I designed my game, for example, my nothing personal back in the day, I had a better percentage if you bought it from Game Salute, who published the game initially, and if yeah. someone, if another country had picked it up and published it, I would have got a lesser percentage. Okay. Because that company would have paid Game Salute a fee, and then I would have got a portion of that fee. You get a percentage right. of that, yeah. So that's how that works. And it sometimes it starts in Europe and comes to America. Sometimes it starts in America, goes to Europe. Sometimes it starts in Japan. You know, whatever. And sometimes because of the relationship that may already exist, they get published simultaneously. Because those publishing partners already are working together and join in very early in the production process. Right. Now, as to what I say when I do the review, it's very simple. I mention the company who sent me the game. Yeah. So if, in a, for example, Quacks of Quellingberg was sent to me by North Star Games, so that's who I mentioned. I'm reviewing the game they sent me. I don't feel yep. the need to mention every publisher because that's really confusing to people. Also, and this is a Mario centric, but I am an Ameri American uh, reviewer who has a largely American uh, uh, viewership. I'll probably mention the one that they should look for. If, if I told right. Americans go look for Schmidt Spiel, they really can't get that. And I'm not a big yes. fan. I know some reviewers like to mention the publisher and designer and artist and price. And to me, that's a bunch of 
information overload for the person listening to the review. But Board Game Geek exists and they have all that stuff and you can look it up. So that's what I would do. That's what I do when I hear about a game and I want to find a copy. The first thing I do is go to Board Game Geek to find who the publisher is. Yeah, I, I agree with the approach. Uh, you know, if I'm holding a game, I'm going to talk about the publisher that published that version of the game that I've got. Unless for some reason it is it is a, a, an important point to say that it originated with somebody else or I have an earlier version that came from a different publisher, then it's an interesting factoid. But basically, whichever version I'm holding is the one I'm going to reference. Nick says, now that you're nearing the end of the alphabet top tens, we have completed it. Yay. I have a question that my friends and I have debated. If you could only play games that start with the same letter of the alphabet for the rest of your life, which letter would you pick? I settled on S, and not just because Smash Up is my favorite game. With S, I have Scythe for big map and campaign potential, Sagrada, one of my wife's favorites, Sabotage, Saboteur, Sheriff of Nottingham, Spyfall, and Secret Hitler for social deduction, Sushi Go for drafting, Sleeping Gods for story, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, and Survive. Those are just a few off the top of my head, and still some absolute favorites like Root and Brass would be absent. I think uh, I'd be able to make a well-rounded collection, and I'm curious what you'd pick. Well, wouldn't you go for, like, the most populous letter? Sure. Um, C has a pretty, a, a pretty strong run for me, the letter C. Uh, hmm. D's okay. I'm sliding through my list here, alphabetized. If I went with P, I'd get Potion Explosion and Pandemic in its variants. Yeah, P is a little too small for me. P is good, but it's probably S, just because there's more words that start with S. It's either S or T. Yeah. And well, if you did T, you'd get all the thes. That's right. You weren't specific I'd let on you that. have all the thes. <laughs> I got Terraforming Mars and The Crew back to back at number seven and eight. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, though, even when I include the thes... I still think I'm going to go with S. Yep, it's S with a, mm. but I could do C also because C has Clank and Cosmic Encounter. Mm. Eric has to take M. That's why he just said M. Mm. I'd have to take M, but I'm trying to figure out what what other what other games would I have other than Merchant. I get two copies of Merchant, and then I have to go back to my top ten M list. But yeah, this would be this would be hard. I'd be annoyed. I'd, I'd probably go for one of the more popular letters just so I have a wider variety of games to play. I'd end up with Munchkin if I went with M. All right. Well, Justin has a controversial question from a controversy that's happening in his group. He's a friend who owns an out-of-print game, and his friend says, go ahead and copy it, make a personal copy. Others in the group are against this idea, saying it's kind of a copyright violation, but my argument is kind it's of. for personal use. So is this okay to make a copy of an out-of-print game without the publisher's permission? <sighs> yeah, this comes up on occasion. Um, I mean, strictly, no. You're making a copy of something that you shouldn't be copying. But if the game is out of print, there is no way to give the publisher money in exchange for the game. It becomes more muddy. Um, and back when Merchant of Venus was not available... I did make a copy of the game uh, for, again, my personal use. But I sort of said, when and if a copy, if a, if a new version comes out, I will immediately run out and buy that game. So that if someone does publish it, I will reward them for doing so. Um, if, if it's just for your own use, you're probably not hurting anything. Um, but yeah, if you're going full letter of the law, you shouldn't be copying something that has... A copyright. I I don't know what the exact laws are. I'm pretty sure I can draw a copy of the Mona Lisa, and that's legit. <laughs> I can play. That's your own derivative work, right? Well, there. I understand. Well, no, I'm what I, I I what if I was a good painter? I go in. Then it's artist practice. Sure, but I paint it and put it on my wall. I'm a, yep. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, there's there, there's no laws against that. I'm not as, as long as I don't sell it. And I think the same thing is with a game. I think I think you could legally 
make a copy of Scythe if you wanted to and go home and play it. I don't think you're mm. going to get in trouble. It's ethically what that we're talking about in this regard. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Ethically, I don't have a problem with anybody making a copy of an out-of-print game because who are you hurting? Nobody. So I don't see what the... I mean, what are you supposed to do? You know, find a designer somewhere and send them 20 bucks? You know, and in the case of Merchants of Venus, the designer's passed away. So... Did, did he pass? I thought the designer had passed I, away, but I might be wrong. I had not heard if Richard Hamblin had passed. I thought he was still Maybe with Maybe I'm us. wrong then. Okay, but let's say okay. it's a Richard Berg game. Someone who has passed away. Um, so... I don't have a problem with it in that regard. That being said, making a copy of a game is a real pain in the neck. <laughs> so <laughs> you're yeah. way better off buying a game. No, I if if the game is not if the game is not published, I'm fine with it. You know, if it's not in print, go ahead, make a copy. I see you sell one of those copies. That's more problematic. So last question from Brian, uh, a term I've heard frequently on the Dice Tower podcast and other sources, and I've often wondered over the term big box. Many people refer to Avalon Hill big box games. I've heard others reference big box expansions, and it seems that the definition is not consistent across several of the cases. I would like to get your perspective on where this term comes from and how its usage has evolved over the past couple of decades. Is this a term that has a single hard definition, or is it, as I suspect, a term which has morphed like a game of telephone Pictionary into a variety of flavors and meanings today? It doesn't help that some companies use big box as a definition, like Queen uses big box to mean a definitive edition of the game that has a bunch of the expansions in one container. Yes. Um, but other, you know, when we talk about a big box expansion, I think that usually means it's an expansion that comes in the same size box as the first game, which would suggest it has lots of stuff well, no, in that's, it, that, that's, as opposed to just a tiny no, little... No, when I say big box expansion, I'm talking usually like Fantasy Flight or other things like for Elder Char. There was the big box expansion and a small box expansion because they would alternate. There would be one big box, okay. one small box, one big box. So the big box expansion was the bigger one. I'm not sure that this matters, though. I mean, it's not in the title. So I just usually say big box when I'm talking about a bigger box. Um, <laughs> now, now yeah. Eric's right, though. Queen has a line of big box games. They're not the only one. I believe there's a Carcassonne big box. There is a Dominion big box. Um, mm. man, I, yep. I I can't tell you how many big boxes are in our, my library right now. I'm getting sick of big boxes. Give me more love letters. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's why, Brian. Hopefully that helps. It, it, it's it's a it's a loosey goosey word, but also I don't know that it matters that much. Yeah, I I don't know if I've ever heard Avalon Hill big box. I know I I heard Aaliyah. I would often call the Aaliyah Big Box the numbered series because there were other Aaliyah numbered boxes that were like medium and small boxes. Um, but it's it's almost always in relation to some other size box to differentiate it as the larger version of, of uh, another line. Compared to Eric, I'm a big man. Compared to the big show from WWE Wrestling, I'm small. Okay. Doesn't that answer the question? I don't think so. Let's I'm, move on. I don't. I think that just raises more questions. It's a dice tower top ten. The dice tower's top ten list is brought to you by Game Nerds at GameNerdz.com. All right. Well, we are a little behind schedule, so we're going to jump right into this this list here. Mean and Nasty Games. Not the first time we did it. We did it back in the 300s. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I did it back in the 100s, I believe. Okay. So I want to be really clear on my list, and I didn't tell Eric to do his list in any particular way. Okay. But my list is, in my opinion, the Mean and Nastiest Games. It has nothing to do with my liking of them. All in right. In fact, some of these I hate. <laughs> <laughs> I I have a few that I dislike as well, but I kept them farther back on the list, and so the ones that are higher up in the ranking are ones I enjoy, despite the fact that they're mean and nasty. 
fine. That's probably not the same way mine is done. Yes. My my top two games I hate. Excellent. <laughs> oh, good. Seeing what, what one of those is, I'm looking forward to this. Okay. All right, let's get going. Number 10. My number 10, Tom is going to talk about later. I don't know why he's not talking about it now, though. And it has me a little bit worried that because he's not talking about it now, that he's doing something behind my back. And I really don't like that. Eric, don't worry about it. Oh, You'll oh. be fine. Okay. Uh, anyway, my number, nine, my number 10 is Age of Steam. Now, there's a lot of games that are railroad games. And railroad games, by very nature, are not pleasant affairs. I mean, I mean uh, pleasant affairs. I'm sure they're fun to play. I like playing them. Okay, but you're usually competing for companies, for goods, and for track space in some way. I'm sure the 18xx games have some viciousness to them. I know the Cran Rail games do. And Age of Steam definitely does. In fact... It's so mean, I prefer the less mean version, Railways of the World. Hmm. But Age of Steam is good, but it has a very, very, very vicious auctioning phase, and you are constantly taking a good from a city and moving it to another right before someone else does, making them lose the game. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and also the game system is, is pretty mean. Uh, in addition to what the other players can do to you, it is well possible to uh, go bankrupt in Age of Steam, and you have to be careful of that. That's true. Not only are the players mean, the game is mean. It's everyone's against you. Are you feeling good? You're like, you know what? I was able to go outside the other day. Life's getting better. Play Age of Steam, it will smack you down. <laughs> but if that's what you're looking for, it's a lovely game. <laughs> Number nine. Number nine. Everyone knows this is coming. Might as well get it out of the way. Citadels! Citadels is a uh, a drafting game where you choose roles. And um, if you play Citadels with me, you figure out every time that I have something useful to do and you assassinate that exact role. So thereby, I do nothing. Everybody else gets to do something, but I do nothing because every time I get a cool card, it gets assassinated. That's number nine, Citadels. We were actually talking about this in the studio today. Not about you, actually. We were just talking about Citadels in general yeah, and about it being a a good game and that people took the assassination card too seriously because it's not even that good of a role to pick. Interesting. All right, my number nine is Cutthroat Caverns, a game in which you are part of a dungeon party killing big giant monsters, except only the person who does the finishing blow gets to keep the experience, and you could deliberately make things so that the monster hits your friends and they die. In fact, you want everyone else to die. You just don't want them to die too early, because if you do, then you'll never beat the monsters on your own. Yeah. It's it's not a friendly game. It, no. it really isn't. In fact, it's it's from Smirk and Dagger. It's yes. the company's name. Sort so. of the, the game that, that put them on the map, if I'm not mistaken. It was their, their first big hit. Um, and, and it's all about, you know, adjusting the order in which you hit the monsters so you get the killing blow and get the points for it, whereas somebody else, you know, swings and misses because the monster's not there anymore. Yeah. This is, this is the only semi-co-op I can think of that I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's mean. I, I, I like this one, but you got to go into it going, hey, hey we're going to have a good time, guys, right? Yeah. Right? Right? So, Cutthroat Caverns. Tone is very important on it, and I think it does nail it. Number eight. Number eight is Survive Escape from Atlantis. You do not, in Survive, want to be the only one on a particular lifeboat. Uh, you're all trying to escape from an island that is sinking, there's monsters in the water, and you got to get your meeples onto a boat um, and get them to shore, because just being on the boat is not enough. Um, and if you're the only one, or or if only like one or two of you are on a boat, the other players are going to send the sea monsters toward that boat. And if they get eaten by a monster, you lose those points. You're not going not gonna to score those people. Uh, it can be very mean and nasty. So work together to survive Escape from Atlantis. Number eight. Yeah, I thought about this one. I didn't put it on my list because it's so fun. I... The meanness is so expected. I don't know how to explain it. But yeah, yeah, okay. def- yeah, yeah. I can see it being mean. Number eight is a Game of Thrones, the board game. Now, I know some of you are probably shocked. How could such a kind, wonderful TV show 
<laughs> produce a mean and nasty game. But lo and behold, yeah, it's it takes another game, Diplomacy, and it uses that base system, and Diplomacy is a mean game in and of itself, mm-hmm. and then adds in a whole bunch of the whole, hey, you know, we're going to stab you, the wildlings are attacking from the north, and here's, you can play some cards and betray other people. It's, I, I once played a game with someone who packed up the game while everyone went and ate lunch. When I came back, he said, oh, I thought we were done. But that wasn't the case. He was just tired of the game being mean. It wasn't okay. me. This isn't one of those. I had a friend, and I'm talking about myself. I would not do that. Uh huh. Wow. Oh, I thought we were done. Yeah. Oh no. I can't bring it out again. We should just play something else. Number seven. So there are not many games that have brought me to tears, um, but Kahuna is one of them. Uh, Kahuna is one of the Cosmos two-player line, uh, and it has this mechanism. You're building uh, bridges between islands, uh, but as you get the majority of bridges on a particular island, it it creates this cascade that removes the bridges of the other player, and it is possible to chain react and remove a bunch of bridges from one island, which then can remove bridges from another island, which then can remove from another. And if that happens, you can get really smacked down in Kahuna. And and there was, on my first play, I just got hit so hard. I was just like, I, I, don't, I don't know what to do now. And, and just got a little overwhelmed. And I, I'm not proud of it, but I was upset playing Kahuna. Number seven. I'm, I don't know what to say at this point. All right, my number seven is Mall of Horror or its sequel, City of Horror, because they're essentially the same game. Uh, one takes place in a mall. One takes place in a city. Zombies are attacking. The zombies are breaking through the walls. At many points that, during the course of the game, they break through the wall, and you need to uh, basically throw someone out to keep them at bay. <laughs> That's it. Mm. So you each person starts with, I think, three characters, maybe four sometimes, but three and there's a room of characters, and you got someone in that room, and you're all arguing with everybody who's getting thrown out. It's going to happen. Someone's getting thrown out. There's going to be a vote. It's mean. <laughs> Everyone yells at everybody this whole game. It's, it's, I find it amusing, but you cannot take this game too seriously. Mall of Horror, which was the original one, and City of Horror. Number six. My number six is Innovation. This is the... Uh, uh, Osmati Games and uh, and uh, what Carl Chuddick is the name of the designer. It, it's a card game. You're you're working your way through technology cards, different ages. But there's this um, these icons that the more of the icons you have, the stronger you are in that particular type of action. And it is possible to get an action that you are ruling in these particular symbols, and the other players can't do anything about it. For a long time. So you can do a lot of smackdown stuff, removing their cards, taking things, uh, scoring extra points when they can't affect it at all. Um, hopefully later in the game, things swing the other direction. Your your awesome move no longer be, is useful and they can hit you back. But at the time, it is really not good. The other players are like, "I all right, I play this card. I take that card. I, I play this card. I destroy that card. And it's it can get really really nasty uh, for for hopefully a small amount of time, but sometimes not. In innovation, number six. Innovation doesn't bother me with its nastiness because I almost exclusively play it with two players, mm. and you fully expect the other person to be nasty to you. Sure. Although so's Kahuna, so I'm not really sure. <laughs> but anyway, um, my number six is a mean game. I don't think I'll play again, and that's True Colors, because this game is literally affects other people. I think this was rethemed with another name at some point, but uh, it came out last year again or two years ago. But True Colors is a game in which you are asked a question and every the question is, who here is the best at surviving in the wilderness? And you put cards into a box and you vote on the players in the game. And then each person guesses how many people voted for them. Okay, that seems somewhat innocuous. Mm. But it will ask questions like, who here is the biggest baby? <laughs> All right, so I'll sit there and go, well, I don't think I'm the biggest baby. Uh, maybe 
uh, maybe one person voted for me. We open it and we find that I got seven votes. I laugh. Everyone else laughs. Ha, 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 ha. And at night I think, really? <laughs> I'm not joking. That's really how the game plays. Like, it'll yeah. be like who's, who's really fun at parties? And you'll, you don't get any votes. And it's so, it's so cutthroat brutal in that way. And I don't think it's fun because of that. Now, there are variations of this game that are different. They'll be like, if Eric was a, a writing utensil, would he be a pen or a pencil or a marker? Okay, that's more silly than not, right? Right. But but when you say, who here is probably the person most likely to cheat on their taxes? Ah, it doesn't feel good if people think it's you. Yeah, yeah. It's not necessarily something that you want revealed in the middle of a nice light party game yeah so that's true colors number five number five we talked about at the top of the show that is barrage uh actually eric when you talked about this i scrolled down yeah to see see if you put it on your list it definitely is this is a is a definite fit uh you you spend your first three actions building this dam and you're all set to finally power up your power plant and on the turn before you do so the your neighbor builds a dam right in front of yours. And it's like, what? that was my engine. That, ah! And so you have to spend the rest of the game trying to butt heads with the next person. Oh, boy. Barrage, number five. Yeah, I I would definitely, this is a good pick for the list. It's, it's frustrating, but it's frustrating in a way I think is worth playing because it's you can mitigate that, I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah. Number five is Risk 2210. I think anyone who's played Risk would agree it belongs on this list in Mm. some form or fashion. So I picked the meanest of the bunch, Risk 2210. And the reason I put this on my list, the same reason I mention every time I put it on one of these lists, is because I have never played this game where someone did not actually get angry. Not faux angry, (laughs) but actual (laughs) anger. And I played it 10 plus times back in the day. Someone got angry every game, and a couple of those times it, it was me. So, um, yep. risk twenty two ten. Yeah, if you send nukes from the moon, that's usually the point at which people get angry. It's really annoying. <laughs> Number four. Number four is bus. Uh, one thing I didn't say about barrage is it has a feel of uh, of splatter titles. Um, where there's not a ton of luck, but the actions of the other players have cascades and and nasty things can happen because somebody decides to get in your way, basically. Bus is a lot like that as well. Pick up and deliver game. You only get 20 actions in bus and uh, and you're placing down your cubes. You have to spend at least two, but you can spend more. And sometimes you may do that to set you up for what is going to be a nice scoring round. And then somebody decides to uh, stop time. So things don't move forward the way you expect or to build a route that messes with you and steal your passengers so you no longer get to score. And you just spent those action cubes for nothing. Nothing. Number four is bus. I got nothing to say to this because I still haven't played it. Oh, man. Do you have the new new version? The Capstone Games? You didn't just persuade me. All right, my number four is Lifeboats, although Lifeboat is also a mean game. Lifeboats is a game where you are on a bunch of boats, your ship has sunk, and it's just like Maul of Horror. Each round, you vote which of the boats springs a leak. Then the people on that boat vote to pick who gets thrown off the boat. Then you vote which boat moves closer to shore. That's it. Every vote makes you angry. Every single vote. (laughs) Or you make someone else angry. Either way, I enjoy this one, but I always have a talk beforehand where I say, okay, everybody, now listen. It's just a game. Listen, it's just a game. Ha 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 ha. It's also not very long, which is why we can enjoy it. Lifeboats. Number three. My number three is Tigris and Euphrates, although you could probably put Yellow and Yangtze, the evolution of the same design, on the list for the same reasons. Um, Tigris and Euphrates is all about building these civilizations and earning cubes for having certain types of tiles out there. Um, and, and they funnel through your leaders and you're going to score points at the end of the game. Um, but as these civiliz- civilizations get larger, you start to have conflicts. And... This is where things can just go 
totally bad because a particularly bad tile draw or a conflict where um, you know six tiles to five tiles and then a, a weird draw comes together and suddenly when you lose a conflict like this it removes tons of tiles and your whole cool civilization that was earning you lots of points is now gone and just decimated and all of that work is done hopefully you earned enough cubes before that happens that you are still in the game, but it is entirely possible that all of your massive plans are now in ruins. Tigris and Euphrates, number three. On a side note, Eric, and I agree, this is a very mean game. Did you see the new tiles on Board Game Geek for Yellow and Yangtze? Uh, no, no, I haven't. You know they make those tiles like for quacks and stuff. Oh, so they're, these are like geek up bits. Yes. What? Yes. What? So they do they replace the tiles themselves? Yes. Oh, man, I'm going to have to buy something now. <laughs> They're really great. <laughs> At least they look great in the picture. Okay. Um, I, I haven't touched. By the time folks have seen this, I will have had them in my hands, but they look good online anyway. Oh, All boy. right. Intrigue is my number three. Intrigue is very similar to Lifeboats. Intrigue, you are running a little business, and you have a bunch of relatives, and you are hiring each other's relatives. Well, you say you're going to hire them. <laughs> I'm like, I'll hire him. Give me $6,000. I'll give him a good job. And I give him the worst job I have. Or I don't give him a job at all. It's it, <laughs> Intrigue is like mini diplomacy. <laughs> there is constant lying and back and forth. The reason I can stomach it is because it's short. It's like 40 minutes or less. If it was longer, Intrigue would lead to real life fist fights. <laughs> You notice it's not being fought for for someone to reprint it because it is a pretty mean game. Hmm. But it's the last one on this list that I'll play. Ah, My number okay. three, Intrigue. Number two. So number two, Through the Ages, is so high on my list, not because it is the meanest of the games, but because it's one I do truly enjoy a lot. But uh, the military aspect of Through the Ages, as you're building these civilizations, uh, getting your technology engine working, there is the military aspect that, especially late in the game, can be really nasty. If you get hit hard enough with a military card, it can destroy your civilization and your ability to even catch up and continue to earn points. Um, it's been mitigated a little bit in the second edition of the game, so it's it's not quite as nasty. I'm speaking more around, about the original version of the game, but you could, if you are not aware of the military issue and don't keep up, you can get smacked down in Through the Ages, which is why it's on the list just Watch out. Buy, get a couple of soldiers on your team. It, it's, a, it's a good idea. Through the Ages, number two. I don't know. This one does not feel as mean to me. Uh, maybe you haven't gotten hit as hard. I, I, I've been warned a few times, but I've also gotten hit pretty hard with the military strategy. Yeah, I guess. I, I feel like I can see it coming a mile away, so it doesn't bother me as much. True, true, true. My number two is... What? Higher than Eric's list. Yes, I give up. Totally I'm not different even gonna, reasons. I'm not going to even try anymore. And finally, number one. Uh, so Tom has uh, has food chain magnate uh, on his list because he apparently doesn't ever want to play it again. I have it so high because I truly do enjoy it. But food chain magnate is a very mean and nasty game, uh, much like the other splatter titles, much like Barrage. Um, The actions that get taken by one player can totally mess with someone who's already locked in their actions for something else. You are um, running a fast food empire, you are advertising for particular types of food, and and trying to earn points by delivering those uh, items of food to willing customers. So it is possible that you spend uh, actions and and money and, and time advertising hamburgers to a particular cluster of the board. And then somebody else builds a restaurant that is closer and cheaper and steals all of that business. And if you're not aware of that being possible and don't see it coming or can't don't don't remain mobile enough to work around it, knowing that somebody might do that, Jason, then you are going to be in a lot of pain playing Food Chain Magnate. And it is also not a short game. (laughs) So uh, it's certainly one that... um, if you have not remained mobile and agile uh, and have been hosed too many times, it, it is going to be a bit of a slog. 
Um, I enjoy that challenge, but this comes with a big warning label that this can get very nasty in food chain magnet. And this is the second spotter game on your list here, huh? So, yeah. Bus being the other one. Yeah. I, and I'll tell you why this one's mean. Because in many games, you are mean to each other. And this it's, it's building this one. So it's not like it's unexpected. But in this one, it can be quite rewarding for the first place player to be incredibly mean to the last place player. Just because it helps them out a little. Hmm. Now, I've only played the game once. I lost 800, some to 40. <laughs> okay. Yep. But you can, in Food Chain Magnet, you can fall behind. You can know halfway through the game you cannot win. You can, and then you can just still get slapped down. That's the thing. That's That makes it meaner, I think, in many ways than my number one, which mm. is diplomacy. Yeah. Because in diplomacy, when you are down to nothing, then everyone starts using you like a pawn, and you'd be like, well, I have some use left. <laughs> um, food chain magnet, when you're down, someone's like, oh, see that guy laying over there? He's bleeding. Go kick him. Anyway, diplomacy is my number one, though. That was Eric's number 10. Yeah. Diplomacy, it meanness is in the game. Now, why is this my number one when I just said mean things about food chain magnet? That's because diplomacy is so long. Yeah. I watch, you know, I... I've been binge watching a bit in the past couple months, some Survivor. I like Survivor. It's an interesting yep. reality TV show. But some people get really upset when someone lies to them on Survivor. And the other person will say, it's a game. You know, you got upset, but it's a game. The fact is, it's a game that lasts for 39 days. Yeah. Yeah. The longer something lasts, the more hurtful betrayal feels. Sure. And that's why diplomacy, which can last seven hours in person, or if you're playing online, Weeks. months, <laughs> you know, it can last a long time. And so when someone does stab you, even if they don't lie to you, even if they look, look, it's been a good run, but it's just not working out between Britain and France anymore. Yeah. And you're like, no, 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 we can do this. I'll try harder. I'll go to therapy. They're like, no, no, I'm attacking you next turn. Sorry. That's all there is to it. That's hurtful. Yeah. Because for four hours you were friends. Yeah. And and yeah, I just won't play this again because I know it's a game. Like I mentioned Lifeboats and Intrigue. I know they're games. I play them. People stab me. At most I get a little irritated because I know it's a game. It's short. But for some reason, the longer you play diplomacy, you get caught up into this maelstrom of tension. Ugh. So when someone stabs you, it feels that much worse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it was my number 10 because it belonged on the list, uh, but it's my number 10 because I would rather play Citadels than Diplomacy. Uh, and, well, and just so would I. It, I mean, my my blood pressure, again, is going up just thinking about it. Uh, the, the, the intrigue and the pressure, even just I, I never felt like I, under, I understood the game and I was being taken advantage of the whole time. It just, ah, ah. That's that's what I say. Ah, diplomacy. All right, let's go quickly through the people's choice. Remember, you can always vote on these by going to dicetower.com. Number 20, The Estates. This is an auction game that's pretty mean because you could like lose all the auctions. Yep. 19, Cutthroat Caverns. 18, Dominant yep. Species. Definitely a very mean worker placement game. Yeah, yeah. Where yep. you can literally wipe someone's species practically off the map. That happened to me on turn two. Number 17 is Agricola. I'm going to go this one. I think it's not the other players being mean and nasty. It's the game. Maybe. I mean, unless everyone is always taking the spot you really, really want. Yeah, but that happens in lots of games. I Stop think it's taking the- family growth. <laughs> That's true. 16's Mission Red Planet. I considered that one. Yeah, but you know what? I think this one doesn't bother me because it's so silly. Mm. I just blew up that spaceship. We're like, I knew you might have. You know, I don't know yeah. how to explain it. Yeah, yeah. 15's Cosmic Encounter. Yeah. Okay. Four, yep. 14 through the ages. So there you go, Eric. 13 Libertalia, which is another version of Citadels, essentially, and how it plays out. Okay. Yeah. 12 Pax Premier. I've not played it, so I don't I know. I haven't. Yeah, I don't know this one. 11, A Game of Thrones board game. 10, Root. I guess 
I don't get the root one because root is literally a war game. Yeah. So you should be mean. Yes. All right. Nine is Monopoly. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> well, how many people do you know who hate Monopoly? Because yep. they got suckered by somebody. I Eight guess. is Citadels. There Good you job, go. Eric. Oh. Seven, Innovation. Mm-hmm. Hey, Six, Lifeboats. Five, Ticket to Ride. You took my route? That was the only way into Cleveland. <laughs> Ticket to Ride can be played, yes. I still remember... Playing Africa for the very first time. It was me, my wife, and Melody. And my wife put two trains in the board on turn three, and I almost threw the cards across the room. <laughs> I was like, I, what? How? I I was so mad. <laughs> Number three of four, food chain magnet. See, folks, it's not just me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> three, survive, escape from Atlantis. Two, diplomacy. And number one, I was not expecting this, munchkin. Okay. All right. I mean, because it's all about smacking somebody down. It's got the kill Dr. Lucky thing where somebody's about to level up or, or reach their 10th level and win the game. And, and yeah, you, you smack them down and prevent them from doing so. All righty, folks. Well, that's it. You got to hear a non-alphabetical list. That's our top 10 mean and nasty games. Thanks so much for listening to Dice Tower. We always appreciate it. Join us on our forums. You know, we love to talk to you there. I don't read everything on the Facebook forum. I try to. There's a lot of stuff there. I do read every single thing on the Board Game Geek forums. So we'll, we'll see you there. But until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode number 712 was recorded on May 27th, 2021. Mandy and Suzanne join you next week, and in two weeks, Suzanne will be here to help us fight over our top 10 dueling games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. If a catastrophic event has become more than you can handle, find out how we can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Mandy, Suzanne, and Eric, with assistance from Rob Searing, Mike Delisio, and Roy Kennedy. Dangerous tourist destinations for the supremely gullible brought to you by Be On The Sun. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Game Nerds, your all-in-one solution for all your nerdy needs at GameNerdsWithAZ.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Tom at Dicetower.com or Eric at Dicetower.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network, including Board Game Blitz, the Portal Gaming Podcast, The Family Gamers, Board Gamers Anonymous, The Broken Meeple, The Game Pit, and Dice Tower Tonight. Find your next favorite at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. I don't know, Tom. Uh, my my blood pressure is high. My heart is beating. I I am a little stressed out. I need. Are we doing a Zen list next? Are we doing calming games next? I I need to calm Ooh. down somehow. That's a good idea. We should do that someday. I think we have. We may have done this when we did it. You know, in episode three hundred. I think we may have done calm games right afterward. But I don't think you have that planned. I'm going to stay stressed for weeks now. Thanks. I'm cool with it.